Good morning, Drummond Island. Good morning. <laughs> and it is a great morning this morning. We did get a bit of a dusting of snow last night, just to be, remind us that winter's not quite over yet. But uh, no, it's a good day today. And we do have uh, announcements. Well, basically just this one announcement. You can read your announcements in your bulletin and on the screen. But uh, the uh, Murder Me, I'm Irish gathering, murder mystery dinner party with audience participation. That's happening uh, March 17th, St. Patty's Day. Doors open at 4.30 for appetizers with clues, followed by mayhem with clues, then dinner with clues, concluded by with the mystery solution and prizes. So it sounds like fun. You can... Uh, I think there's information in, in the bulletin, isn't there? But tickets are 30 bucks a person. It, it goes to a, a good cause, doesn't it? EUP. There's a dinner, and you can re reserve, reserve your spot by calling the Reiners. Anyway, this, we can post this or circulate it around. It's small, but it's, it's mighty. But anyway, that's coming up on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. That sh sounds like a lot of fun. <coughs> Reservations are due by when, John? Yesterday. Yesterday? <laughs> so if you want to go, if you want to go, uh, you can give that, give them a call. The number's right there. And lilies. And if you'd like to sign up for an Easter lily, which is coming up pretty soon, in just really a couple of weeks. Yeah. So, uh, Easter lilies, you can sign up for them in memory of somebody that you love, and they're ten, it's a $10 donation. You can leave it on the desk out there or with Sue. or You guys on Facebook, if you want to call something in or give a $10 donation or whatever, and you want something, just email us, let us know, and that will be published on Easter Day. Easter Day, we have a breakfast at 9.30. Uh, those who are helping, the suggestion is to be here at 8 o'clock, uh, and to help, we'll be downstairs getting things ready. Uh, most likely, I, I've heard a rumor that the world-famous pancakes by John Griefer will be present at Easter. Bre I just, I, I don't know if that rumor is true, but it's you know, so uh, world-famous pancakes. So, and there'll be other things, egg, sausage, all sorts of wonderful things. It's a com community breakfast, so invite people to come. Uh, free food and good fellowship. So that's not, that'll be 9.30 and then 10.30 is our worship time. So it should be a good time. Nobody f needs to fall asleep though with a big full stomach you know, after <laughs> breakfast. But it should be a good time. Easter morning and I'm thinking of some sort of giveaway. You know, something to give away to people. Something that would be fun. Speaking of gives, giveaways, we had a giveaway last week, a mezuzah. What's a mezuzah, you say? Oi, a mezuzah is, it's a little um, piece of metal. Do we have a mezuzah here? <clears throat> it, it's a little, it's a piece of metal that has writing on it, and it's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our Lord, your Lord, is one. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, love your neighbors yourself. And it's just a reminder of what the core value, there it is, mezuzah, with the little, it has a little scroll that goes kind of attached on the back, and that scroll is in Hebrew and in English. So Jews all around the world have these things. They go on your doorpost, okay, and it's just a reminder, it's a mental reminder of what life is all about. Hero Israel. The Lord, your Lord, is one. And well, I'll talk about that just briefly in a few minutes. But uh, it's fun. They're free. Can't beat that. And you guys, again, on Facebook, if you want one of these mezuzahs, for you, they're only twenty nine ninety five plus shipping and handling. Now, they're free to you, too. So we'll send them to you. <clears throat> just let us know uh, if you'd like a mezuzah. You have to spell it correctly, though. No, you don't. So... Let's pray. Let's pray that God opens our hearts this morning and, and that we're able to capture some this idea about oneness. I, I want to, Kirk got it started and, 
this whole idea of being one with God. And what does that look like? What, what's it taste like or feel like? And how do you stay in that? You know, how do you stay in this oneness stuff? Um, and still do your regular daily chores and jobs and stuff. So Jesus, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You're always with us. Thank you for your faithfulness in opening our hearts to be able to hear the things that we need to hear and do the things we need to do and just uh, be able to walk with you. So help us, Lord. Inspire us. Put that word or that phrase or that picture in our minds and in our hearts something that we can walk away with, something that we can, we can grab hold of that will be our next step in our spiritual journeying with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you meet us where we are, but you never leave us there. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Okay, let's uh, sing some songs this morning. Songs about the love of God. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising. I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing, your love makes me sing, your love makes me sing, sing, hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love makes me sing. Amen. Hallelujah. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And 
he walks with me and he talks with me and tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds flush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry them none other has ever known i'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me is falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken.
together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together with love. We are the family of God. We are the promise divine. We are God's chosen together, Lord, bind us together, bind us together with love. John? Lord God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the snow on the ground and mm -hmm. the chill in the air is um, something that we've missed a little bit, maybe not as much as... Uh, some of the warmth that we've been experiencing, but um, Lord, we just thank you for each new day, whatever it brings. And um, today, Lord, we ask that you would just bring us all together in this place, yeah. bind us together with your love and your word and your mercy. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, can the kids stay in for just a moment? Because I actually have a little story that would be cool for the kids and then you guys can can go out i mean adults can listen too but it's more for kids really <laughs> so once upon a time there was a little stream little stream it wasn't a big river it was a little stream but it was enough water for birds to fly down and they would get a little drink of water. It was enough for little squirrels would go up and they would get some water. There, wasn't, there were little tiny fish in it, not big fish, little tiny fish. But it was a little stream and that little stream would flow, whether it was summer or winter or any time. That little stream would just keep, flow down. It was up in the mountains, would flow down day in and day out. But that little stream, it would dream about, it would dream about where it came from. It came from the ocean. And the ocean, the big old ocean, it would, the sun would come down and heat up the ocean and the steam would come up and make clouds in the sky. And the little stream would dream about, yeah, I, I was once a part of that ocean and I, my little water would come up and I would become a cloud and I would f go over the mountains, and then the rain would come, and it would make me my little, I'd be the little stream. That's where I came from. But the little stream longed, I want to be back and be connected to, I want to be one with the ocean. I want to be back and touching the ocean again, because that's where I came from, that wonderful big old ocean. I want to be there. So it would flow down, and it would dream about one day, being connected back to the ocean where it came from. And all of a sudden, this little stream discovered that there was a bigger stream that was flowing down, and it became a part of that bigger stream, and it would go over rocks and things like that, and, and people would, would raft on it. They would put canoes in it and all this. It was a big stream. And then finally, it would go into another little stream again for a little while, and it would go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then back into a river. It would go into this big river again. And this river kept flowing down and there were lots of birds and fish and all sorts of things in this big river. And it moved so fast. It moved so fast. And it was, the little stream was moving along when the big river and it finally the big river dumped into the ocean. And little stream said, I'm finally, I'm connected with the ocean. I'm finally connected. And all of a sudden there was this laughter and the waves in the ocean would kind of pop up each time the ocean would laugh. Oh, ho, ho, ho. And the little stream said, well, why are you laughing? And big ocean said, well, because you were always connected to me. 
through the other streams and rivers and things like that. You were always connected to me. You were never, ever alone. I was always with you. And with that, the ocean would laugh again and the waves would go up. And little stream was happy. Finally, it was connected to where it was born in the ocean. Okay, you guys have fun. <laughs> now the adults are going, what, where, where is he going to go with this? <laughs> All right. You can be my um, visual aid in a couple weeks. So the idea, have fun, you guys. Yeah, there's one up there, too. <laughs> so the idea is, I mean, just to jump off of that, is that in a sense, the little stream lives inside of all of us. We all long to be back to our origins, that, that place that gave us birth. And I'm not talking about our mothers physically. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about God, that all of us, are here on this earth because God gave birth to us, in a sense. That you are here because God has placed you here. And that you have an important purpose. And we long inside of ourselves to be reconnected with God. That we try to connect ourselves with other things. A um, good cup of coffee or um, a martini or, or other kinds of things in our lives. We try to make these connections and, and and we want to be connected to stuff and to people and to ourselves and all of this. But we, we tend to get off track. And like little stream, we don't realize that we're connected already. And it's more of a matter of waking up rather than striving to make our own connections. And Kirk talked last week about image of God, what, that that affects how we wake up or how we're in touch with this oneness with God, how we're in touch with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Kirk talked about how important your image of God is. And most of us have a, a warped or bent image of God. That's what it is to be human. We, we do the best we can, but we've, we've got this bent image of God. And remember, Kirk gave us two very starkly different images. There was the wheelchair that was here, and you had the image of God where the person in the wheelchair, th there was a mess all around it, and the, person, the other person was going, you clean that up or there'll be hell to pay, remember? There'll be hell to pay. It was angry, and it was, it was awful and, and just uh, tensed up inside. That was the first image. And then he went through and, and talked about how the church through the ages has tried to wrestle with this idea of God that's given to us by Jesus. A generous, loving, amazing God. And, and how the church has tried to use doctrines and theologies and dogmas and, and all sorts of descriptors to try to contain this or grab a hold of it. And which is natural in some ways, but we hold on to it too tightly. But when we finally let go, the second image comes up. There's the wheelchair there again. And he got down on his knees, remember? And just said, I love you. I can clean this mess up. But I love you. I want to be here to support you and serve you and, and love you. And kind words flowed out of Kirk's mouth. And, and we could feel, I mean, the room, I mean, you almost felt a breath of relief that that was the final image, a place where we're working towards and trying to understand uh, who God is. Just like Little Stream, we long to be connected in some way and, and we we. We strive and we try to work towards this oneness with God and we work hard on our spiritual journeys. But we get it wrong oftentimes. And that's the great tragedy. Because what's required for us to stay in this oneness, those times when we've experienced amazing love, 
or amazing acceptance. Places where we've discovered, you know, that I really, I'm in a safe and secure place. Those brief and, and fleeting experiences of, of God in nature or a sunset or a sunrise. Or, or a, a devoted animal, a pet, or, or little children playing, or just things that inspire within us that, that longing to connect with the source of all of that. To connect with God. How do we stay there? And so I'm going to suggest that there are five attitude shifts. Attitude shifts. That we can go through. And that we can work on. That will bring us and keep us in that place of oneness with God. Coming to that place like little stream. That the ocean is all around us. That we've always been connected. Five attitude shifts. And I, this comes with a little bit with a warning, okay? <laughs> because some of these will cause some pushback inside of you. I know that. I can predict that, okay? Some of the things that I'm going to say are going to cause some resistance. That's one way that you can know that <laughs> that's probably what you need to work on, okay? That's fine. So when you feel that resistance inside, listen for Jesus speaking to your heart. And just perhaps he's saying, we'll, we'll try that out together. Just don't worry. Don't be afraid. The rest of you may feel a spark. It may be something more positive where some word or idea or something like that that I say, God will use that to spark something inside, spark a fire in your soul. That's cool too. But listen carefully, whether it's resistance or some sort of spark, listen carefully to what God is doing because God's doing stuff inside of your spirit. Listen carefully. Take a breath. Listen carefully. Okay. So I have to use, I, I want to make sure I get them straight. Five attitude shifts. Shifting from one place to a new place. That will help you sustain that oneness with God. The first attitude shift is from disconnection to connection. From disconnected to connected. And just like Little Stream, the first attitude shift is to realize that you're already connected to God. You are. You're not disconnected. That's because of the faithfulness of God. That's, you hear about that all throughout the Old Testament. And then Jesus performs that in the New Testament. There's nobody who's so far, so bad, so awful that they're not connected to God. Jesus talked about that connection in terms of just sunlight coming down. And I'm presuming that he's in a desert place and not on Drummond Island, but um, where the sunlight is coming down. And he said, the sun shines on the good and the bad all the time. Or rain, maybe that's more Drummond Islandy. Uh, rain or snow, the s rain and snow fall on everyone, the good and the evil. That's God's connection. That's God's part. God is faithful to make that connection. We're all connected to that love, to that truth, to that wonder, that treasure, that oneness is already an established reality. Now, Jesus' first words in Mark is the kingdom of God is here. Believe it. Well, it re he says repent too. Repent, remember, means to shift do an attitude shift from one thing to another. Instead of just following along in our usual attitude or mindset, Jesus says you've got to have an attitude shift. That's repentance. It's not just, oh, I feel sorry for this. No, it's much more radical than that. It's a total shift of understanding, of trying to think in new ways. And one of those ways is that the kingdom of God... Thank you, Jesus. The kingdom of God isn't static. It doesn't, it's not like way out there, and we've got to run to go get it. The kingdom of God, he said, he used a Greek word that meant it's arriving, and it's on your doorstep right now. It's arriving. The kingdom of God has movement. It's chasing after you, because it's a king who chases after you, loves you that much comes running and chasing after you at all times. Even when I'm bad, 
Yep. Even when I don't go to church? Yep. Even when I don't do the things I'm supposed to do? Yep. God is continually chasing after you. What a different mindset. But that's one of the primary shifts. And we're all there. I mean, we're all kind of moving towards that, hopefully, in some way, shape, or form, and in different places with that. But to try to get it through our head that God pursues you, that God's coming after you, and that it, it's up to us, our choices, whether we want to accept that reality or try to live in our own disconnected reality. If we want to do that, God's going to let us do that. But God will be sad. Jesus will be sad. There'll be tears in his eyes. And your life will be disconnected. And you'll always try to live up to certain standards or whatever bars that you set. And that little voice inside will just say, yeah, you didn't make it this time. I don't think you're ever going to make it. And instead of listening to that little disconnected voice, to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, I'm here, I love you, let's do this day together. Because we're connected. I am the stream, I am the ocean, I am the river of life that flows in and through you and out of you. So that's the first shift. I'm thinking about one of the most powerful scriptures. Uh, besides the last week when Kirk mentioned the Shema, uh, Hear, O Israel, your, your Lord, the Lord is one. That the idea that it's not just a statement about God, it's a statement about all of reality, what life is like, real life. In fact, any statement about God is not just a statement about a being, it's how we are to be. It's a statement about what reality itself looks like. And so there's a oneness and a connectedness to all of reality. I've got a, a sermon sheet, you know, a half sheet that's out in the foyer that has a whole ton of different scriptures and Bible passages that you can explore on this whole oneness deal. Um, you can look them up yourself. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, the first 16 verses. I want you to listen carefully to the words of Paul. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Let's take a look. So Paul, it's a prison letter. So Paul's, once again, he's thrown in prison. And that seemed to be a place where he'd end up oftentimes. And he says, therefore... I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, listen to this, who is over all and through all and in all. But, in, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does that mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Catching all this unity language stuff? And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to what? The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, like what Kirk talked about last week, 
by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you also walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And he goes on to talk about that. That's the shift that takes place. We get our hearts hardened because we get hurt in life, because life comes at us unexpectedly, because there's surprises in life, our expectations are blown apart, and we get angry, we get disappointed, and we hold on, and we try so hard, even harder, to make life work. And it's just like sand through our fingers. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. The only way to do that is the second shift. And that is a shift from distrust to trust. Because you can take two paths. You can take the path of distrust. You can trust no one but yourself. You can walk through life and try to do all the stuff and build your little empire, do whatever you want to do, and only trust yourself. But the Bible calls that death. Jesus said it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, a plant that says to its roots, I don't need you. I don't need you. And, uh, you know, tries to operate without a root system. And the plant withers and dies. But so often we try to do that. We, neg we neglect where we're rooted, which is in God. And we try to proceed off in our distrustful kind of attitude. Well, God is calling us, inviting us to make that shift, to trust. Because there, within your spirit, even though you may have been through a tough life, and you felt you have the wounds, you bear the wounds of a really hard life, there's still that small voice, that little voice, that whisper of God that says, you can trust me. You can trust me. And Jesus comes to us and says, I extend a hand to you. You can trust me. I will get you through this. And learning to listen to that still small voice each and every day, practicing that each and every day, even when you don't feel like it, just, okay, I know connected to you, you will make things different and new and refreshing and joyful, even though I may not feel that right now. God is continually serving you good things because God loves you. Jesus demonstrated that. Remember, Jesus is the perfect picture of God that we have. And oftentimes we get into trouble, at least our theology gets into trouble, when we, just, we take... Jesus said, we put him over here, and it's, he's cool. You know, he's Jesus in blue jeans. He's like, what's up, dude? You know, what up? And all this. And he's like our, our homie, our pal. And, and, oh, but then there's God the Father. You know, all stern and all this. Because after all, he has to run the universe. And, and you're in it, you know, and so he's got to keep things in line and lightning bolts a few times, you know, uh, here and there. And it is really stern. And what we do is Jesus doesn't look anything like God the Father. But Jesus is the, is the perfect representation of God the Father. Over and over and over we hear that in the New Testament. He is he's God, but we don't treat him that way. And so when Jesus does something, the least small thing in the Gospels, that's a picture of God 
the, the God of the universe, the one who holds the cosmos together, who births stars and universes and planets and everything like that. That's what God looks like. So when Jesus gets down on his knees and washes the feet of his disciples, the last week of his life, facing death, facing a torturous death, Jesus takes the time to get down on his knees and washes the feet of his disciples with the servant's towel over his arm. That's a picture of God. But it takes a major attitude shift to begin to appreciate that. Can God wash your feet? Ever? Would you let him? Would you be like Peter? <laughs> Not me, Lord. You know, Do it to somebody else. Remember Jesus' response to that. Unless I wash your feet, you have nothing to do with each other. You have nothing to do with me. Because it's so crucial to understand that image of God, the God who serves you, who washes your feet, the God who loves you and wants to be with you. That's the God that you can trust. The Jesus-shaped God who died for you on a cross, who wouldn't stop loving you no matter what kinds of stones or nails or whips that you throw at him. He will never, ever stop loving you. It's called unconditional love. There's nothing that you can do that will cause God to love you less. There's nothing that you can do that will cause God to love you more. God loves you with 100% of his being. 100% every moment of the day and night. That's a God you can trust. The third shift is to shift an attitude shift from protection to surrender. From protection to surrender. Because oftentimes when we try to operate independently, disconnectedly, and again, when we're hurt emotionally or any other way, we gather in the forces, we put up the walls, the machine gun nests come up, and we are protecting ourselves. And that's a natural human response. I mean, it's a normal thing to do that protective thing. But Jesus calls us to something more. Because the problem is, is that while we throw up the walls and the machine gun nests and all this protective stuff, is that it may protect you in the short term against, you know, some sort of threat that's out there. It keeps you disconnected. It keeps you separated from God's fullness. Protection keeps you separated from God's fullness. And so the shift is over to surrender. I surrender my whole need to self-preservation. Self I surrender that to you, Jesus. I surrender to you all of the ways in which I try to keep people at a distance so that I can think that I can be safe. I surrender that to you, Jesus. I surrender to you all the places where I've, I've thrown up walls in relationships and, and places that aren't healthy, unhealthy boundaries thinking that I can hide behind those and be safe. I surrender that to you, Jesus. And out of that comes a brokenness that is unlike any experience of brokenness you've ever had. Because we want to protect ourselves against anything that threatens our comfort. I mean, if we're really honest. We want to throw up boundaries and, and distance between anything that will disrupt our comfort level, if we're honest. And so Jesus says there's a way that we can walk through this brokenness, this hurt, whatever it is, together. There's a way we can do that. Oh, no, Jesus. Been there, done that. You know, <laughs> too tough. You don't want to go there yourself. I'm trying to spare you, too, Jesus, some pain. You know, and we're looking out for Jesus. But Jesus goes, no, no, I, I'm used to it. It's fine. We'll walk through this together. And there's a place in surrender where you can walk through the pain. You can walk through the pain even when it feels like you're dying. 
you can walk through the pain with Jesus and come out more whole than you were before. I don't know how he does it, but it happens. And there's something about the brokenness. I think Jesus called it carrying your cross or something like that. But there's something about that that changes you and opens you up. It's like, it's like you've got all these cracks and stuff and you're going, I'm falling apart. And Jesus goes, exactly. That's exactly what we want because Jesus comes in, God comes in, the Holy Spirit comes in through all those cracks and fissures and, and holes, potholes in our soul. God comes in and is able to come in and then shine out. That's surrender. And learning to practice that. Places, okay, not, maybe not the big hurt places. I mean, you'll do the protection thing and all that. But maybe little hurt places. Maybe smaller places where God, you hear the whisper of God. And he says, let's try walking through this. It's like surrender 101 or something like that. So you, you go, well, we'll try it. And then you fail utterly. You fall apart. You throw up the boundaries. You get angry. You, you get, get all flustered. And God says, that's cool. That's okay. There'll be other times. And that there'll be other things that come up. But it's taking the step, being having the courage, taking the willingness to take that step with him. So going from a protection kind of mindset, they're all out to get me. To a place of they may all they may be out to get you. I don't know, you know. <laughs> Maybe the conspiracy people are right. No. It's just it, but but I will not, I remember telling, talking to somebody years ago about conspiracy stuff, and they painted pictures, some amazing picture. And I said, you know what? I said, maybe it's all, maybe it is true, or some of it's true. I said, but I looked them in the eye, and I said, I will absolutely not live my life out of fear. I refuse to do that. And maybe there is government stuff and all sorts of things going on, but I refuse to absolutely refuse to live my life out of fear. I will not do that. The alternative is faith or trust or surrender. The fourth shift is from magic to mystery. The fourth shift is from magic to mystery. And magic is fun, you know, in children's stories and things like that. But there's a dark side to magic. And the Bible talks about this, you know. But the dark side of magic has to do with the C word, control. And with magic, you can do incantations, you can do little formulas and things like that that will achieve a result that will benefit you. And I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, whether magic is real or not real or whatever, but the intent, the, the, the process is that you do certain things and then you get a result and whether it's frog legs or chemicals or just things in your own mind, self-help kinds of things, that you do the five different rules, then you'll get this wonderful result. The New Testament counters the idea of magic and the idea that you're in control of your own destiny with this notion, what Paul calls mystery, mystery. The mystery specifically that is in Christ. And mystery is similar to magic in some ways in that it's kind of otherworldly. It seems outside of the natural realm. But there's a crucial difference. And it's the same difference we just talked about that it requires not control but a surrender of control. To enter into the mystery of Christ, to experience the fullness of Christ, to walk into that and continue to walk in that experience requires that you understand the mystery of Christ. It's not something that grabs hold of you, it's some, or it's not something you grab hold of, like magic. It's not something you grab hold of, it's something that grabs you, someone that grabs you. And it's entering into that mind shift 
that you walk in the mystery of Christ. You don't have to explain it. You don't. You just simply, well, as we said, tell your story. Your experience is your experience. And to walk in that experience, that mystery of Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Let's take a look at that real quick. Colossians 1, 24 through 27. Paul talks about, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is his church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the listen to this, the mystery which has been hidden from this past, the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God, God willed to be made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is not only the present experience of who Christ is, the one who holds together all things. That unity holds together all things. You get to experience and be a part of that. But it's also one that looks to the future, that grants you hope. It's not just about the presence. It's about a future that is filled with hope. Not because you're going to manufacture it, but you will be a participant with a greater power, a greater love, a greater truth than what you could even imagine. That's what mystery is about. It's a dynamic experience of the God who holds all things together, including your life. And then finally, number five, fifth attitude shift, is to shift from life as gain, something you've gained, to life as a gift. The shift from life is something you gain, and you're always gaining stuff, to life as a gift. And it opens up the whole idea of gratitude. We've talked about that before. That there is a, a wonderful, liberating kind of experience when you can give thanks and say thank you to God for even the smallest aspect of your day. There's something that sets you free. It sets your spirit free. And that's that experience of oneness with God. You're more in touch. You're more connected. You're more mindful of what God is doing all around you when you can say Thank you. Thank you, God. Even when life goes down the toilet, you can say, thank you, God, that the toilet is at least flushing correctly. You know? You know, you can at least ask, you can thank God for something in your mail storm of, of chaos and crazy stuff. You can at least thank God for something. And learning to practice that gratitude, life as a gift, will keep you, sustain you in that experience of oneness with God. And each one of these shifts, these mental shifts, will keep you in that moving, say, in that direction. Walking in the Spirit, as Paul would say. He talks about that in the book of Galatians. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means to maintain a sense, a growing sense of a God who loves you and will see you through all of life and you don't have to travel it alone. Thank God. That's sustaining your oneness with God. And maybe God's kind of tapping you on the shoulder. Maybe God's kind of pricking your heart or, or saying something to you right now. And you can feel either that resistance or that draw that comes from God. 
and to one particular word or aspect of what's been said this morning. Go for it. Go for it. Take that step of courage in the direction that God is calling you. Explore that realm. You go, well, it's going to shake you up. It's going to shake up some portion of what you think is real. That's part of the process. Is that letting go and taking on and grabbing the hand of the one who loves you. You can do this. You can do this whether you're you're out in you're working or with kids or grandkids or out whatever you're doing, you can practice these things. It's a spiritual practice that's doable. But let Jesus help you and form you and have your sticky notes and reminders and all sorts of objects and different whatever helps remind you of the truth of God's kingdom. That it's different from our kingdom. That it's different from our reality. And let those places in your reality, your false reality, go. And grab hold of the one who is really the way, the truth, and the life. Because he knows. He knows the pathway that is the very best way for you. God loves you. Oh, how he loves you. How he loves you. He loves you. Listen to this song that we're about to sing. And uh, some of you may have heard this through the David Crowder band. um, And that's how I originally heard it. But uh, it actually wasn't written by David Crowder. Uh, written by th- this other guy. So, uh, John, w- John, Mc- John Mark McMillan. McMillan, thank you. So, just listen to the words on this. Sing along with us in the chorus or whatever place you want to tap into. But just absorb this. If you don't hear anything else, hear that God loves you and will never, ever let you go. for me Loved like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves 
loves us how he loves us all his portion he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets us like a sloppy wet kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh Oh, Lord, <clears throat> thank you so much for this day. Thank you for what we've heard. Help us to go towards you, go towards that oneness. And um, this verse, this last verse in the song, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If yeah. grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And I want to sink into that ocean, and mm. I want to be closer to you, and I want these shifts to take place in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, we want to be like little stream, right? Getting back to sinking in the ocean. So thank you, Facebookers and YouTubers. Thanks for being with us this morning. We appreciate your love and support, and, and we want to maintain that, that oneness with you too. So put some comments down on uh, if you're streaming live here, or just even if you're not, let us know what you're prayer requests are and the places where we can support one another um, and any responses too, maybe what God's doing in your life, a little brief response about it could be an inspiration to somebody else. So just thank you so much for being with us this morning, your love, support, your financial gifts. Check out things on our website, www.lighthousechurchdrummanisland.com for our latest things that are happening, whether it's soup suppers or Whatever we're up to, 
uh, Easter breakfast. And if you are on the island, please come by, pay us a call. We'd love to hear from you. So God bless, have a great week, and work on those attitude shifts. Have fun.